Well, today we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Now, you're going to notice with me as we go through this, I'm going to break this into two sections. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 together, and then next time we're together, we'll look at verse 7. Verses 1 through 6 in 1 Peter speak concerning wives, and then verse 7 speaks concerning husbands. And there is a, a, a reason for that. It's because women require six verses, whereas men are so perfect, we only needed a mention. And that's, I mean, that's a Bible. Come on now. Don't fight me. <laughs> I might not even teach verse 7. I don't think we need to. So we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6 today. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your beauty be that outward adorning or of arranging the hair, of wearing gold, or of putting on fine apparel. But let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so as we begin here, we note that Peter is continuing a thought a thought concerning proper submission to authority. When you look in chapter 2 at verse 12, you'll note that he had exhorted believers to live honorably before unbelievers and began to instruct them how to do so. So in verses 13 through 17, he instructed us concerning submission to government. In verses 18 through 20, he spoke of submission to a master's authority and then in verses 21 through 25, he used Jesus Christ as the greatest example of an individual who properly was in submission. And so he's just continuing what he had already begun here in chapter 3, and he's instructing concerning a relationship of husbands and their wives. He begins to turn his attention to the Christian community, and he does so by, by focusing on marriages. This is the place that the church really has a genuine interface with the world when it comes to marriages. Because there are those who don't know the Lord who are married, and there are those who do know the Lord who are married. Seeing that we're, as human beings, married, we have a, an interface that we can have in that we can speak concerning what makes our marriages what they are. And when we have good marriages in the Lord, they provide a great testimony to people who might have a question concerning those things that they see to be resonant within us and in our relationships. And so he's beginning to speak concerning Christian marriages. Now he's been writing concerning submission and he's now making it very practical. He knows that a, a marriage can have a powerful witness and he knows that healthy relationships between husbands and wives is a cement that keeps a family together and therefore he begins by writing to the wife. Now. He's writing to wives, especially those who became Christians after they had been married. You see, if their husband was unsaved, they would have questions related to remaining married to him because they were undoubtedly aware that believers are not to marry unbelievers. Remember who the Apostle Peter is writing to. He's writing to Jewish people and Jewish people who had come to faith in Christ. And so as he's writing concerning that and writing to the diaspora, to those who have been scattered abroad, he's writing to Jews, and the Jews would have a knowledge of what the Old Testament said concerning marriage. You see, in the Old Testament, in various places, there are commands related to marriage, and, and one of the commands that is related to marriage is that, that a, a Jewish individual was not to intermarry with a person who was not of the Jewish faith. They were not to be married to unbelievers, referred to in Scripture as pagans, as the heathens, because the Jewish nation had a covenantal relationship with God, and it was the Jews' responsibility to be faithful to their God, and therefore God says in His Word in the Old Testament that the Jews were not to have marriages with unbelievers. 
You can see that in various places. One example is Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. God had said, do not intermarry. Do not make covenantal relationships with unbelievers because what is going to happen is they will turn your heart from me. You see, when a believer marries an unbeliever, it's easier for the believer to be influenced by the unbeliever than vice versa. And so God, in his wisdom, gives instructions to Israel and says, do not marry unbelievers. Why? They will turn your heart from me. Man in scripture by the name of Solomon is regarded as the wisest man. This is the one who when God was speaking to him on one occasion, the Lord God speaking to Solomon had said to him, ask, make your request, it can be as high as heaven. What do you desire from me? And I'll do it for you. And we all know his answer. His answer was, well, I'm basically just a child. I don't even know how to go in and outside of the, of the house without protection. I'm just an immature individual. You've given to me the relationship with, as a king over this great people. Give me wisdom. And so his request of God was that he might have wisdom so that he might govern God's people. And, and God said, well, you didn't ask for victory over your enemies. You didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for lands and various things like that. I'm going to give you wisdom as well as these other things. And so he's known as being the wisest man in the Old Testament. And yet, according to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, Uptites, Adasites, Cellulites. He married all the ites. There are ites everywhere. <laughs> he married all these women. And it says, From the nation of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives. Oh, <laughs> princesses, and 300 concubines. Yeah. And his wives turned away his heart. 700 women in his life. And his wives turned away his heart. So God had warned them. He said, do not make relationships like that with unbelievers. Why? They will turn your heart from me. Solomon's a prime example of that. Indeed, his heart was turned from the Lord. Now, this command not to marry unbelievers is not only found in the old, it's also found in the new. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What do you have in common with someone who doesn't love Jesus Christ? What do you find so attractive about them so that they draw you from your walk with Jesus Christ? The fact that you're drawn to somebody who doesn't love Christ reveals more about you than it does about them. The fact that you have a desire to be with somebody who doesn't love the Lord and doesn't care about Jesus dying on the cross for them says more about my faith than it does about their lack of it. And that's why Paul would say that. What do you have in common with an unbeliever? What do you have in common with... With, with someone who doesn't know the Lord. What, what in common does light have with darkness? What in common does God have with Satan? There's nothing in common is the whole point that he's making. And so we are forbidden in the old as well as the new to have relationships of such nature with those who don't know the Lord. Now, the people here that the Apostle Peter is writing to in 1 Peter chapter 3, these are people who are undoubtedly those who became saved after they got married. And so similar to the, the case with the Corinthians, they're beginning to wonder what they should do. Should they divorce these people that they're married to? You see, in 1 Corinthians, those who have been with me on Sunday nights will know this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul has begun to answer questions that the church of Corinth has actually been asking him. 
And one of the questions related to marriage, covenantal relationships of marriage, and, and they were beginning to think, should we divorce our unsaved spouse? Seeing that we are now saved and they're unsaved and we're not supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, should we get divorced? And the Apostle Paul had to answer that question, and he does so in 1 Corinthians 7, 12, and 13, when he says to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So he said, no, you remain with them if they're willing to remain with you. Because in doing so, you'll have opportunity to remain together, perhaps win him to faith in Christ, and raise your children together. So if you're not to divorce him, then what should a person do who's married to an unbeliever? Well, the Apostle Peter, as well as the Apostle Paul, would have the same answer. Do your best to influence them for the kingdom of God. So he begins in verse 1 here in 1 Peter chapter 3 by saying, Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Likewise, in the same manner, be submissive. Now, he's not speaking of them comparing themselves to slaves. He's saying, likewise, in that Jesus Christ himself was submitted as the greatest example of submission, likewise, you should be submitted too. He's continuing the theme of submission. Now, obviously, in, in our culture, the idea of a woman submitting to her husband is really looked at as being just, well, it's an idea that's rejected. It's not something that is common to be accepted. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's rebelled against. I mean, imagine me standing up in front of the National Organization of Women and teaching this passage to them. I, imagine how happy they would be with me if I stood up and said, women, submit to your husbands. Do you think they'd stand up and say, oh yes, the voice of a God, we shall do that? No, after they finished beating me. I mean, they would not like that. You know that and I know that. The world rejects the idea of submission, let alone a woman actually submitting herself to her husband. I mean, in our day and age, it's very common for the husbands to be mocked anyway. Husbands are looked at as being really stupid. If you don't think so, and some would argue that point, watch TV, watch a commercial. And the guy's sitting there, and the wife walks in and says, we need to get a new car. He goes, okay. <laughs> what kind should we get? <laughs> I don't even know where to start, duh. Well, I say we need to start at the starting line. And there's the start, and he steps out. And she's in front, this is the car I want. That's what we see today. And there are a lot of husbands who resent that. And I understand why. We don't even know how to fix our own computers, do we? We sit there, oh, I'll we'll go have to get a new one. And she says, oh, no, all you got to do is push this button here, stupid. <laughs> oh, wow, honey, you're a goddess. Yeah, I'm going out with the girls. And I, and I see these commercials. They're so insulting. They are so insulting to men. But it's okay, right? It's okay to insult men. And so the idea of submission is not something that is really, well, it's not looked at as being a great thing. You have to learn that <laughs> submission is part of the proper order of God. And secondly, you have to learn the value of your husband's soul. Why would it be important to submit that he may be one? for Jesus Christ. You have to value the husband's soul. And that's the context, by the way. That's what he's dealing with here. He's dealing with the fact that this woman is married to an unbeliever. And the greatest thing that she should have is not uh, domination for her rights, but how can my husband come to faith in Jesus Christ? How valuable is his soul? And so, what he's writing to is he's writing to women who may have it very difficult. She's living with what has been called a beloved unbeliever, someone who doesn't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And this is a person who doesn't show any interest. Notice how it says, likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of the wives. So what she's dealing with is a very difficult situation. She has a husband who is objecting to her faith in Christ. Now, you need to know that in the context of this, during the time of the writing, that a Jewish woman, 
for her to change her religion would have been unthinkable. You see, if a man came to faith in Christ, he simply would take his wife and family to church because he could do that. But a Jewish woman coming to faith in Christ, well, that was an unheard of thing because she was under the subjection to her husband and therefore for a Jewish woman to actually turn to Christ would have been an amazing thing. For the Greek woman, well, the Greek during the time of the writing, the Greek woman was the, the wife, was the woman that the husband had his legitimate children with. Very often the Greek man had some women on the side that he enjoyed sexually, but, but he had his legitimate children with his wife. And, and what she basically did is she stayed home and made the home for him while he went out and enjoyed his life. The Romans were, were different in that the women there actually were under the domination of the father. So a little girl born into the home had the father who would rule over her in, in the Roman society, and the father had, in her life, he had the power of life and death. He could actually have her put to death, or put her to death with impunity. And when she got married, he transferred that right to the husband. So with that knowledge that the Jewish woman would not, would not normally come to faith in Christ because of uh, Jewish religion, and the Greeks uh, didn't allow for that, and neither did the Romans, you can see how, how courageous and what a miracle it would be for this woman to come to faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now that she has come to faith in Christ, how is she going to win her husband to the Lord? Well, he says, be submissive to your own husbands. Notice he, he doesn't say, well, just divorce him. He doesn't say, argue with him. He doesn't say, Preach to him or transform him, improve him, perfect him. He doesn't say that. He says, submit to him. When I used to do premarital counseling, I've shared this before, but it bears repetition at this point. When I used to do the premarital counseling here in the church, I would sit down with the young man and the young woman, and I would do several weeks of premarital counseling, and I can still remember I would look at the young man, also known as victim, I would look at him, <laughs> and I would say to victim, I would say, in every relationship, there are certain things about the partner that you begin to observe and realize ought to be changed. Have you observed anything in your young lady's life that you think ought to change upon marriage or prior to marriage. And the guy would kind of sit there looking around the room, kind of like a bobblehead doll, you know. <laughs> no. I said, there's nothing at all about her that you think could change. <laughs> no. She's perfect. Yep, that's okay. Honey, I'd say to the young woman, and this young man that's about to marry you, is there anything that you would like to change? And she'd pull out this list and just... <laughs> you want it to be alphabetical order or numerically? <laughs> I mean, she had a list. She always did. She always had a list. Always. He never had one. He's like the ox going to slaughter. Oh, 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 I'm going to have a happy day. No, you're not. You're getting your head cut off. <laughs> he didn't have a clue. He never did because he just didn't see these things because he's thinking of his marriage night. He's always thinking about a honeymoon. <laughs> and she's thinking, you know what? He's going to have to start picking up his socks. He's going to have to lose 10 pounds. He's got, I mean, she had a list of things. And so, so I think it's part of human nature. There is just this desire to, to perfect and transform, to teach, instruct. I mean, you know, you take him, he goes with you shopping, and you treat him like a little boy. If you buy him an ice cream, he'll sit there and eat the ice cream while you shop, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of women still think that way about their men. They do. And we have timeout chairs in some of the stores that we go to. You guys have been there in the timeout chair. I've been there many times. I sit there next to the guy. How long are you here for, man? What you do? 
You got to the shoes yet? No, oh man, don't even go there. <laughs> I actually have had some real fun conversations with other victims on the timeout chair. Purgatory exists, it's called the mall. How are you going to change your husband? You going to lecture him into change? You going to tell him, if you don't change, this is going to change? You bargain with him, argue with him, perfect him, teach him, train him? Marie and I were newlyweds within the first few months of our marriage, and as is common, I think, in just relationship, there were things that she discovered about me that were less than perfect. And um, on one occasion, I still remember having a conversation with my newly bri newlywed bride, and, and I remember some of it. I remember saying something like, um, you know, I didn't marry my mom. I didn't want to marry my mom. If I wanted a mom, I wouldn't be married to you. I married a woman. And I said, and the reason I married a woman is because I'm in love with the woman and I don't want that woman changing me because she doesn't think that I'm doing what she wants and therefore we're at an impasse here and we're going to have a talk because I don't play that. If you want me to change, talk to me. But don't try and change me because that's God's work. That's what God does. And I'm willing to change for you, but don't change me because I didn't marry my mom, I married you. I don't wanna be babied, I wanna be treated with respect. That's how it works. And you know what, my wife, after I woke up, said that's okay. <laughs> she, she put that board away and she learned her lesson. <laughs> when I got out of that hospital, I showed her who was the boss. <laughs> we, we, we did have a conversation that was like that. And uh, it was a very important one because the fact of the matter is, ladies, if you want your husband to change, then the one who changes is you. And if I want my wife to change, then I change because my wife responds to me. See, she responds to me. And see, because I'm a husband who wants to love my wife and I want to do the right thing, then I have a tendency of, of responding to the changes. So when God is working in her life, it makes me want to be a godly man. It makes me want to be more in the Word. It makes me want to be more prayerful. It makes me want to be the kind of man that she should have. But if she started lecturing me, saying, you don't read to me, and you don't pray with me, and you don't do devotions with the kids, yeah, I'm still obstinate enough to say, you know what, is that important? Yeah, well, okay, I understand that. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to do what you want on your timetable. We're going to have a problem here. And so a long time ago, we learned that if we want change, we change ourselves. And the Apostle Peter is simply saying, ladies, he is saying, they can be obstinately opposed to the things of the gospel. When he says, and I want you to notice this, that even some, in verse 1, do not obey the word, he is speaking of aggressive disobedience here. This is the husband who says, I don't like the changes I've seen in you. I don't like the fact that you get up on Sunday, go to church, and then you want to go back Sunday night. I don't like the idea of you being in a woman's group, and I don't like the idea of you going on Wednesday night. Come on, we, we got married to be together, and now you don't want to be with me anymore. What's up with this? And I don't like this, and he's aggressively disobedient. You used to be a lot of fun. We used to go to Vegas. We used to go out and dance. We used to go to bars. We used to do all these things, and now you're not wanting to do that anymore. You're not the woman I married. I don't like He's aggressively disobedient to the word. He doesn't want that. He wants you the way you used to be, is what the Apostle Peter's speaking about. He's aggressively disobedient. I do not like that. I don't like the things that you're doing. I don't like how you've changed. Now, the woman has gone to church. She hears Bible studies. She sees other couples there in church. She wants her husband to be with her. She comes home. She begins to share with him. She begins to minister to him. She wants him to get saved. She goes into his car and puts all the presets on 107.9. She makes him a sandwich for lunch, and he opens up the sandwich, begins to eat. He tastes something, moves the bread, and finds a piece of paper. Man does not live by bread alone. <laughs> he says, this is crazy. What happened to this woman? He's aggressively disobedient. He doesn't like what she's become. How does that work? How do you, how do you bring change? What can be done? Well, he says, without a word, they may be won by the conduct of the wife. You can use your influence for good. 
When he says, without a word may be won, that word won is a, a term that is used in missions. It speaks of winning them to favor, winning them to the Lord. So what can possibly be done to win them to the Lord? He says, verse 2, they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. They, they watch you. That word observe is a very strong Greek word. It's what we would today call instant replay. It would be an instant replay kind of uh, uh, observation where you're looking very intensely at the screen. So he watches you because husbands will watch the wife. And they can learn the wife not by what she says, but by what she is. What she is. If my wife is saying to me, I love you, but she's always disrespecting me, then I think she doesn't understand what the word love means. If my wife's saying, I'm being patient with you as she's yelling at me, I don't think she understands what the word patience means. And so I observe her because I've told Marie many times, I appreciate the fact that she'll tell me that she loves me, and I do appreciate hearing that. And as a human being, I, I need to hear those words, I love you. That means a lot to me. But I've told my own wife more than once over the years, don't just tell me, show me. I want to see what love is. I want to know what it is in your activities, not in your words, because talk is cheap, but activity is different. And that's basically what he's saying. They observe you, and they're looking for two things. One is for your modesty, your chaste conduct, and the other is your reverence or your fear. So there are two things he's looking at, he's saying. He's looking at your modest behavior, the way that you live. He's seeing your character revealed in your activity, and he's seeing your reverence for God that is acted out in your respect for him your genuine admiration. And these are the things that draws his heart to the woman, not just her outward beauty. That's why he says in verse 3, do not let your beauty be that outward adorning of ranging the hair or wearing gold or putting on fine apparel, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. So he's saying it's not just the outward attractiveness. And thank God for the outward attractiveness, of course. And you see your wife and you find her beautiful and you're attractive to, uh, attracted to her, that's a good thing. When you see the girl that you eventually begin to date and you want to get married, uh, many times we men, uh, the first thing we notice is her beauty. And we do notice outward beauty and there's nothing wrong with that. See, there are some, there are some denominations, some churches that teach that that Peter is saying that a woman shouldn't do her hair, she shouldn't wear jewelry, she shouldn't wear makeup and all. And, and, and I've said this before, I thank God for makeup. <laughs> Makeup's a good thing on women. When I see men with makeup, ah, but women with makeup, that's a good thing. The barn needs painting, you know. <laughs> that's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm going to get run out of town on a rail, I know that. <laughs> I'm treading thin ice. But the bottom line is, is he is not forbidding a woman to have herself made beautiful. But remember your beauty. This is something that will help you, I'm, I know. Ladies, your beauty is reserved for God and your husband. That's who your beauty is reserved for. It's not reserved for some other man on the job. It certainly isn't reserved for one of the neighbors. It is not reserved to compete with other women who are beautiful. Your beauty is reserved for your husband. That's who it's reserved for. And that's why he can safely trust in you because your beauty is for him. The reason that you get dressed the way that you do and all of that is so that you might be attractive to him. Many years ago, I learned that lesson through my wife. We would go shopping like we did yesterday. And uh, she would put on something and walk out like she did yesterday. And we'll say, how do I look in this? And I'm a man. And I'd look at her and I'd say, let's go. <laughs> it looks fine. She said, no, is this nice? <laughs> this is the truth. I would say, I don't care. I'm not wearing it often. No. <laughs> no, I'm not going to wear it. And that's what I'd say. I'd say, honey, I don't care. Let's get out of here. You know, I'm feeling awkward. 
I'm sitting here and I can see women in these dressing rooms and I see dresses and pants falling on the ground. I don't want to see that. I want to get out of here. So just buy it. And the Lord had to speak to me about that. He said, because I tell her, what does it matter? Look, when I go to buy jeans, I don't walk and put on, how do I look? <laughs> I don't even try them on. Here, yeah, give me those. Let's get out of here. I don't do that, you know? I, I don't do that. You walk in, you have to try 14 dresses on, and then we leave with none of them. It drives me crazy. And then you buy one, and you bring it back. Why? Why do you do that? Me, I grab the jeans. And, and that's just the way it is. We'll put these things on later on. Let's get out of here, right? That's just, is that your right size? You want to try a different shirt on? No. I don't even want to, I don't want to try this one on. I just want to get it. Let's get out of here. I don't like this. I'm in hell, don't you see? <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me. He said, her beauty is reserved for you. And she's putting that on so that you can approve it because it's your vote that matters. So I learned that the first thing she puts on is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Nothing can top that. You've just hit a home run, bases loaded. We won the game. She got two home runs yesterday. Your beauty is reserved for your husband not for the women you're competing with, not with, for the guy on the job, not for somebody, it's for your husband if you're married. That's who your beauty is reserved for. When you're single, your beauty is an expression of your heart and it can be an act of worship to your God. But it doesn't have to be so that you feel good about yourself because of the way you're looking because after all, how I feel about me is the most important thing in the universe. Because unfortunately, and we all understand and know this, because women know that men see, and so they dress so that we will see them, they will wear all kinds of things that can move from just nice to the immodest. And I've noticed, and it's the summer, but I've noticed that some of the things that women are wearing today, especially the younger women, and then the older ones who think they're young, which is very sad indeed. <laughs> You've heard of the mushroom, right? They put on pants and they're, they look like a mushroom. Uh, that is not pretty. <laughs> that should not be outside. <laughs> I'm just telling you, don't do it, man. But some of these young ladies are wearing running pants that are looking, I thought they were underwear. They're running in their calzones. They're running in their underwear. <laughs> Very immodest. And then they're pushing their tops up. You know, when they're running, they're getting black eyes. It's just, dangerous. it's just dangerous. Don't run like that. That should be illegal. <laughs> Dress modestly. You're more than your figure. You're more than, than the outward appearance. That's what the apostle is saying. The apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 said, like this, said it like this. He said, I, I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. So it, it, it's not the outer appearance at all. You see, during the time of the writing, the Greek women had nothing to do at home, so they played dress up all day long. They adorned their hair, they put on their costly jewelry, and they played house. And he's saying you're acting as if you have nothing more important to do than just to adorn your outside. You're much more than your outside. 
You are a child of God. You're beautiful from the inside out. And not only that, it's like what it says in, in, in the book of Proverbs 31.10. Uh, it speaks of a man being attracted to the beauty of your heart when it says in verse 10 in Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies. And then in verse 30 of the same chapter goes on to say, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And, and that's how it works, the beauty. I didn't even notice that my wife Marie is a beautiful woman. I didn't even notice that for a long time because what I saw with her was her heart. It was her heart. When I met Marie and she sat down and spoke to me, I said, there's something different about this young lady. There's something different about her. She is just immediate, immediately likable. There's something about her that is very attractive. She just had that general sense. When she came to faith in Christ, it just exploded. We got married and uh, it took me, I think, two or three years until I finally started actually realizing that not only was my wife beautiful from her heart, but my wife is a beautiful woman. And, and I never even realized that because she won me by her conduct. She won me by the way she is. I could trust this woman here. She, I, could, I could give her my heart and she won't break it. See, I had other relationships, not many, but others, and I, that, that it, they didn't do well, you know? And it was mostly my fault. It's just a fact. But when I finally got the courage to tell this, this young woman, I love you, I, I still remember how I did it. I, 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 I held my hands out like this, and I said, Marie, I'm gonna tell you something. And I said, in, I said, for a moment, think about it. In my hands is my heart. I'm handing my heart to you. And I said, it breaks very easily has been broken before. And I went like this, and I said, I'm giving it to you. Please, don't break my heart, please. I still remember that. And I said, I love you. And that's when I finally broke down and said to her, I love you. And I have never taken that heart back because she's been worthy of that love. That's how it works. And it isn't the outside, it's been the heart. And that's what he's speaking about. And he finally says, for in verse five and six, in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So Marie and I were dating, we're on a drive, it's gonna take us a couple hours to get to where we're going. I say to her, we ought to read the Bible. She said, that'd be good. I, she says, anything in particular? I said, First Peter, chapter three. <laughs> she says, okay. She opens it, begins to read. She gets to verse six and reads out loud, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And I said, wait, what did that say? She said, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I said, that is so good. That's Bible. I said, Lord David, Sounds very, very good to me. So from now on, you can call me Lord. She didn't. She's rebellious. Lord, she showed him reverence and respect. Now remember for a moment that Sarah is not her original name. Her original name is Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, Sarai. Sarai was married to a man named Abram. And so the Lord God appears to Abram, begins to give him these incredible promises of how he's gonna multiply his seed. If you number the, the grains of sand or you can count the stars, that's how many are gonna call you father and, and all of that. But over time, nothing happens. And finally, Sarai approaches her husband and says, why don't you just go into my handmaid, uh, Hagar, and, and, and uh, she'll conceive through you and you can bring, she can bring forth a child and, and that child will be mine because she's my, con she's my uh, handmaid and she'll be your concubine and, and legally I can raise that child as mine, it'll be called mine and therefore just do that. So Abram has uh, relations with Hagar, she gives birth to Ishmael and uh, he thinks that the promise has been fulfilled in Ishmael. So later on the Lord begins to minister to Abram again and, and Abram says to him, may Ishmael live before you. And God says, I'm not blessing you through it, Ishmael. No, no, it's through Sarah, Sarai, that 
that my promise will be fulfilled. And Sarai is doing something other women wouldn't do. They'd never think of it. They're, she's in the tent listening in on the conversation her husband's having with God. She, and other women wouldn't do that. They'd be busy straightening up the tent and all of that. But there she is. Ah, what's going on? And she's listening and she laughs. <laughs> I'm 90 years old. There's no way I'm going to get pregnant. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and God says to Abram, why did Sarah, Sarai laugh? And, and, and his wife begins to answer God, I didn't laugh. She's saying that from the tent. I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. You did laugh. I heard you laugh. But just so that you know, I'm capable of keeping my promises. This time next year, you're going to have a child. 90 years old. You're going to have a child, and you're going to name him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. So when you have laughter, and you call laughter, you will remember nothing's too hard for the Lord. Amen. Nothing. And so, later on, God changes Abram's name to Abraham, father of many nations. And God changes Sarai's name to Sarah. Sarai means dominative. Sarah means princess. Abram means exalted high father. Abraham means father of many nations. What's interesting is the changing of the name just requires a letter, the letter H. Sarai is changed to Sarah. When you pronounce it properly, the H has a sound. Sarah and Abraham, it has that. Those of you who've been to Israel, when you hear uh, Hebrew spoken, you'll hear that sound. And that is a, breathe, a breathing that takes place when you pronounce the word. Sarah is a breathing. The word breath in Hebrew is ruach, because the sound, ruach. Ruach is a breath. It can also be spoken of as the spirit of God or the breath of God. The thing that made Sarah, Sarai, Sarah, is the breath of God. When God breathes on this woman and made her a princess. How can you influence your husband? By walking in the spirit of God and learning that it's not the inside, uh, rather the outside, it's the inside that matters and God can breathe on you and move you from being one way by his spirit into being another way. He can transform you, and that's why she was able to say of her husband, you are my Lord, not that you're my God, but that you have authority in my life. I, she could say, who has been a dominator, am now submitted to the man God is using in my life that I can be the kind of wife, Sarah would say, that you need to have in your life. How does that take place, ladies? By the breathing of the Holy Spirit in your life to transform you from one person to the other.